Hello and welcome to Global Business Europe, live from CGTN in London. I'm Paul Barber. And I'm Juliet Mann. Our top stories. Face to face for the first time in two years. G7 foreign ministers meet in London. Plus... <laughs> Opposition supporters celebrate in West Bengal. The Indian Prime Minister loses a key election as the COVID death toll continues to soar. The EU looks to open up to foreign tourists this summer after a year of pandemic isolation. Apple goes to court as a leading games firm sues it over claims of market abuse. And an immersive experience like none other. How technology is transforming China's tourism industry. Your bags. Europe wants to welcome international tourists this summer after a year of tough restrictions on non-essential travel. Brussels has put forward a proposal that would give the green light to fully vaccinated people. Well, Tony Waterman joins us now from Brussels. Hello there, Tony. Tell us a little bit more, a bit of the detail of this proposal. Well, Juliet, one thing to note here is that this is not going to be a blanket reopening. It is going to be limited to non-EU countries that have their COVID-19 situations under control, which is being defined as 100 cases per 100,000 inhabitants or less. So given that criteria right now, if Europe was to open, then the UK uh, and Russians would be allowed in, but the United States, Americans would not be allowed in under this criteria. Uh, the other part of this is that people who are fully vaccinated will be allowed uh, into Europe, but they need to be vaccinated with an EU-approved vaccine. There are four right now. That's AstraZeneca, um, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. They could extend that to the WHO list, but neither Emma's list or the WHO's list uh, include the Russian Sputnik vaccine or the Chinese vaccines, the Sinopharm or Sinovac. Uh, so that's the main two big pieces of the criteria. Uh, there's also an emergency break which has been embedded in this proposal. So if the COVID situation starts to deteriorate in some of these countries, they can pull that lever and cut off travel uh, from those countries. But this is not going to be a replacement when it comes to entry requirements. So travelers may still have to present a negative COVID-19 test upon arrival, perhaps even quarantine. That's going to be a decision left up to individual member states. But this is really uh, the first big step in getting Europe reopened to the outside world has been shut now for over a year. You say it's the first big step um, and it could have a huge impact, couldn't it? Not just on tourist destinations, individual countries, but the global economy. Yeah, so let me put it this way for you, Juliet. It's been estimated that the tourism industry in Europe is losing over a billion dollars uh, every single month during this pandemic. So this, even if it's a partial reopening, could have a major impact on the economies here, especially for places like Spain, Italy, and France. These are the top tourist destinations for international travelers, and they've been losing out on billions of dollars in, in revenue, and they literally welcome millions and millions of tourists uh, every single year. So this could have uh, a lot of uh, a big impact. And of course, economists have been saying now for months that there's a lot of pent up demand when it comes to getting out of lockdown, going on that trip, buying things. Uh, so this could have a major um, impact. But of course, this is not going to be that silver bullet to completely jump starting the tourism industry. We heard earlier today that Germany has decided to cancel for the second year in a row Oktoberfest. So uh, it could be some time still before this takes off the tourism industry again. Uh, this needs to be adopted by the council. It's hoped that they're going to do that by the end of this month, which means that the welcome mat could be rolled out for tourists as soon as early June. But there are still some details that are going to have to be worked out here. One of them uh, being able to verify that it's a valid and true COVID uh, vaccine certificate that these travelers have in hand. And the commission has been speaking with international governments trying to work through those details so they have a system in place by early summer. All in the detail for early summer. Tony Waterman, thanks very much for the update. Staying in Europe because access to the continent's dwindling fishing stocks remains one of the biggest issues for policymakers in Brussels. Now, researchers in the UK have begun a project tracking the movements of some of Europe's most popular breeds of fish. It's hoped the results of the scheme can help with better decision making. More at europe.cgtn.com. 
Hong Kong's stock market has felt the pinch from China's May Day holiday season. Its Hang Seng index ended more than 1% lower due to subdued trading. Meanwhile, rising COVID-19 cases in the region have raised concerns of more restrictive measures and deeper economic pain. Financial chiefs from China, Japan, South Korea and 10 ASEAN nations have pledged to strengthen regional cooperation and provide support to countries hit hard by the pandemic. Asia's economies are expected to rebound this year, but the recovery appears to be uneven across the region. Kosovo has become the first region in Europe without printed daily newspapers. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were five daily papers. But according to the editor of one of them, the pandemic has accelerated an inevitable switch to online news. Kosovo's Print Media Council Association fears the change will hit older generations hardest. A landmark legal case against Apple has begun. The tech giant is being sued by Epic Games, the maker of the popular video game Fortnite. Epic claims Apple abused its market position when it removed the firm from its app store last year. Epic has been offering users alternative ways to access its app, but bypassed Apple's 30% charge. Apple CEO Steve Cook is among those expected to give evidence in the case, which is being closely watched by regulators around the world, not least in Europe. Last week, the European Commission charged Apple with using its dominant position in the music streaming market to choke off competition from rivals. And it follows a complaint by Spotify. Let's go live now to New York and John Terrett. So, John, what's yeah. Epic's case about? Yeah, Juliet and Paul, this is the big story over here today. It really is. You know, Epic Games is based in North Carolina. People go, really? I thought it was based in California, Silicon Valley. No, no, it's in North Carolina. I think it's a place called Raleigh, which is a five or eight hour drive south of Washington, D.C., depending on how long you take. And I think it's proof that these companies, global influencing companies like this, can be based pretty much anywhere these days, because I'm quite sure the developers who work on the games that they produce will not be going to any kind of central location. They'll be doing it all from home, like so many others during the lockdown. Now, their big product, the one that really stands, and they have a number of games, but the big one is called Fortnite. Now, Fortnite is, yes, a very violent game, actually, but it's more, not so much the violence. It's more a game of survival with Fortnite. You are the last man standing. So you go in and you can play the game with your friends or you can play the game with complete strangers, or I suppose you can play it on your own if you want. You can play it for a bit, have lunch, go back and pick up, all that sort of thing. And it is a worldwide global phenomenon. Now, one of our producers told me today that he won't let his young son play on Fortnite because it is a very, very addictive game, and that can be a problem. Now, Epic Games is saying of Apple that basically they charge too much for access, particularly for Fortnite, to the App Store, and they're now suing them under antitrust provisions. Now, as you said just now, Paul, the European Union is also going after Apple at this time after a complaint from Spotify. That's a gatekeeper issue, but it's very bad timing for Apple. And basically... Epic says 30% to use the App Store is just too much for developers and publishers. And that they really only have two choices, the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. So they launched their own app regarding Fortnite, and Apple kicked them off the App Store. And that's when the lawyers for Epic leapt in and said, aha, we've got you now. This is antitrust practices, and we are going to sue you. And they've led a very elaborate campaign on video and online against Apple since they filed the suit. Paul and Juliet. So what's Apple saying in response, John? Well, the big thing is that Tim Cook, who's the CEO, is actually going to give evidence, we are told, in this case. So that's very interesting in and of itself because, you know, you want to keep a bit of, you know, surprise element there. Tim Cook doesn't do very much in public because the more he does, the the less his value is as a CEO. So it's good to keep him under wraps a little bit. So he is going to come out, and I gather this is the first time he will have represented Apple in a major court case. Apple's argument is basically, who was it that invented the Play Store? Oh, we 
yes, it was us, wasn't it? Yes. So we'll <laughs> just charge exactly what we like. Thank you very much indeed. And they say that many developers do get access to the store free of charge. And they say that some developers, the apps need vetting. And that's the case with Fortnite and with Epic Games. That's why they charge them 30%. But as I say, the timing is not very good because the European Union is going after Apple for exactly the same reasons after that complaint from Spotify. And as I say, that's more of a gatekeeping issue. But the point is, they're both coming at Apple from both sides at the moment on pretty much the same issue. Mm, yeah, going to be really interesting to see what happens. Meanwhile, we have some big firms revealing their earnings this week, don't we? Yes, we do. We really do. Now, last week we had 66, I think it was, members of the S&P 500 giving us their earnings. Some of the big tech names gave us their earnings, and they were all pretty good, as you know. This week I've just picked out a handful of companies. I think, actually, this may be a busier week, but the company's not quite so exciting. However... We've got Pfizer and Moderna providing us with the vaccines at the moment. Pfizer, New York, Moderna, Boston. We've got General Motors up in Detroit giving us their latest set of earnings. And, of course, we'll see how much the chip shortage has impacted their business. Uber and Lyft, the ride-hailing services. We've got PayPal and Square, the payment companies. We've got Viacom, CBS, the television people. We've got Roku, which makes the bits that allow us to stream all this stuff on our computers. And we've got Peloton. The bike with a TV on the top. <laughs> Paul and Julia. <laughs> it's going to be a busy week for you, John. Thank you very much indeed. John Terrett in New York. Still ahead on Global Business Europe, one of the leading management consultancy firms highlights the challenges facing businesses. Even though COVID-19 has been the mother of all disruptions, it's still disruption that's keeping executives awake at night. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to the Agenda podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Covering the world from four continents, a new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington, D.C., Nairobi, and London. Who connect, interact, and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The Link, only on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Back to Global Business Europe, live from London. And a quick reminder, CGTN is available to watch for free on all the major digital platforms, on Smart TV or online, on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. You can also find us on YouTube and Daily Motion, as well as CGTN.com and the CGTN app. The pandemic has caused massive disruption to the global economy and to businesses worldwide. But how lasting will its effect be? A survey of more than 3,000 global executives found that 37% think the pandemic has permanently altered their emphasis on health and safety. A third of those surveyed by Alex Partners say it has changed their remote working practices for good. But perhaps surprisingly, COVID-19 was not the main concern among businesses. 
other forces, including artificial intelligence and robotics, data privacy and security, and new and evolving competition were seen as more disruptive in the long term. Simon Freakley is the CEO of global management consultancy firm Alex Partners. I asked him what keeps executives up at night. Even before we'd heard of COVID-19, uh, many, many industries were being fundamentally disrupted. And even though COVID-19 has been the mother of all disruptions, it's still disruption that's keeping executives awake at night, but not necessarily COVID. You say this affects many industries, but does it impact in a different way, sector to sector or region to region? Well, I think some of the disruptions are, are universal. Take technology, for instance, the way in which artificial intelligence, business machine learning is really reimagining uh, so many industries and businesses. But within technology, think about connectivity, smartphones, three billion of them in the world. Uh, on average, a smartphone user spends three hours a day on smartphones. They curate their own world, whether it's news, whether it's consumer goods, whether it's services. And so every industry is being touched by this, some more profoundly than others, but every industry is being touched by disruption. And people, our demands and expectations play a big part in this, don't they? Well, it's so interesting, you know, because of this sort of curation of one's own world through uh, an online life, you know, we look at products through the lens of our values. Geography becomes less important. It's not just a matter of which store is nearby to go and pick the product up from. Product can be delivered from pretty much anywhere, uh, sometimes overnight. And so people are um, curating their own environment for product and news, irrespective of geography. And so this connectivity within technology has become an accelerant of disruption, not just a disruption itself. And this trend is not stopping anytime soon. You talk about these disruptive forces, but many of them were around pre-pandemic. What, what has really changed? Well, I think a couple of things have changed, honestly. I think, firstly, the pace at which disruption uh, is happening has increased. And while we were in a rolling sea before, we're now in a choppy sea because so many disruptions are happening all at the same time. You know, it used to be, Juliet, uh, that we'd all watch the economic cycles and wonder, are we going, it's still going to go through growth? Is there going to be a recession? When will growth top out? <clears throat> what we've now found is that disruption is the new economic driver and these economic cycles are secondary. These the choppiness of all of these disruptions accelerating in pace are what are driving companies to have to be agile, to have to move quickly in terms of new business models, to let go some of the business models that did work pre-disruption, the integrated value chains, for instance, and really think about how to compete in an environment that's changing quickly, but also an environment which is promoting lots of new competitors on the back of the opportunities that these disruptions are affording. You talk about competition, you talk about opportunities. Let, let's talk about risk, because we hear about black swans and grey rhinos, the, the rare and unpredictable events versus the great big yeah. obvious ones we don't pay enough attention to. Was COVID-19 running right at us and what might be just over the horizon? Well, it seems that the only people that really thought seriously about COVID-19 were Bill Gates and the trustees of Wimbledon tennis competition. Uh, the trustees of Wimbledon took out a pandemic insurance a couple of years before we'd heard of COVID-19. But of course, the vast majority of people were not baking a pandemic into their business plans. Their risk maps, looking at all of the likely risks to affect their businesses, considered all sorts of things like, for instance, cyber risk, which remains the number one worry for executives around the world. Uh, but people hadn't considered the pandemic. But what COVID-19 has taught us all is that we don't have perfect knowledge, that things will be a surprise, and that we have to remain agile in the face of change. And one of the ways that this plays out so powerfully is the responsibility of leaders to give clear vision as to where the business can go, but to remain flexible in terms of the strategies to get the business where they need to go. So not being a hostage of previous strategies, making sure there is a clear vision of where the company needs to go. But you're talking to and advising businesses around the clock. So who has that toolkit? Who have those strategies to cope with disruption? I'll give you a quick example of that. Arne Sorensen, who sadly uh, recently passed away, the chief executive of Marriott Group, saw his business, 435,000 employees worldwide, come to a grinding halt in COVID. Every single Marriott outlet was shut, uh, but they 
took very quick action to ensure they contained the cost of that, furloughed employees with help from government and federal programs, uh, looked at how they could use their uh, hotels and facilities for other purposes, and just recently you will have seen that Marriott has announced that they're back in profit even before we're out of the pandemic. So strong, deliberate, clear leadership is at a real premium. Intercontinental Hotels Group, which counts Holiday Inn and Crown Plaza in its portfolio, has been in China for 37 years. In 2020, the group saw better revenue per room on the mainland than for its other global markets. Our reporter Wei Lin Tang spoke to Jolian Bully, CEO for Greater China. We think back at this time last year, we were just starting to see some of the green shoots of recovery uh, for our industry as the May Day holiday came, where people were feeling confident to travel locally or nearby their cities to reunite with families or friends. And that trend continued with leisure travel being very, very strong throughout 2020. Um, and in quarter four, as you said, um, we started to see a lot more commercial business and meetings travel. Um, and therefore, that was sort of the indicator that we expect to go into 2021. Now, as we know, the virus doesn't discriminate and we had some outbreaks uh, early in the year where actions were taken again to contain and to eradicate the virus. But as March came uh, and people were able to travel, we started to see that flow happen. And April results are indicative of what we saw um, in Q4 2020. We still believe that this is a golden era of growth for the hospitality and travel industry in China. Talk to us about IHG's expansion plans and pipelines uh, in the next three to five years um, in China. Uh, in December last year, we opened our 500th hotel, which was a big milestone. And um, it's now around about 520 hotels today. But if we add our opened hotels and what we call our pipeline hotels, which are deals signed and those hotels to open over the coming three to four years combined, uh, we've just crossed the 1,000 hotel milestone there. So that gives us an indicator of what, what growth lies ahead. Um, but that will continue as we penetrate further into, into China. We're represented today in about 170 cities. There are 600 cities in China. 70% um, of our hotels are in tier two to four cities. So the growth uh, opportunity um, is really positive. The fastest growing segment that is the upper mid-scale segment and our Holiday and Express brand is the one that we see penetrating deeper into these you know, 600 cities over a period of time. Your competitors are also expanding into the upper mid-scale segment. So at what point do you feel that it might become a little bit saturated? Well, it's unknown at this point in time, but um, you know, as, as domestic travel continues to, to increase, and 90% of our demand or our customer base is Chinese domestic travellers. And they're travelling much more freely now, and they've got access to travel. The emergence of the Tourism and Culture Ministry several years ago has brought a new dimension to leisure travel, as people not only are aspiring to get to the resort destinations, but the culture, the heritage, the nature, all of these destinations are now accessible, and once people get there, they require a place to stay, which is where our industry comes into play as well. Well, we are day three into China's Labor Day holiday, and domestic tourism is the focus. While many places are luring people with their historic appeal, others seek to wow visitors with a truly immersive and larger-than-life experience. CGTN's Greg Lafredi reports. In eastern China's Zhejiang province, the renowned scenic zone known as Qiandaohu is acquiring an ambitious new feature dubbed the Time Tunnel. Built over the past six months, the facility promises an eye-opening experience to visitors during the May Day holidays. The trial run over the past week has drawn many visitors. All of them were deeply impressed by the way the Time Tunnel has managed to merge with the existing scenery and facility of Qiandaohu. The project manager of the Time Tunnel is confident that the new addition will further boost the charm of the tourism hotspot. The Time Tunnel is the biggest interactive experience space project in China. The latest technologies have been deployed to render the dazzling show. Virtual reality and augmented reality will treat spectators with a variable visual feast. It will be a much needed complement to the charming scenery of the resort. We believe the project is injecting fresh blood to local tourism 
Now the virtual and the realistic are blending to offer an all-around experience. In southwestern China's Sichuan province, the Jianmen Guan Scenic Zone is staging a nighttime show titled The Grand Song of the Sword Pass. The show combines 3D lighting with reenactments of legendary episodes from the mountain pass's history. Two years in the making, the show aims to attract more tourists from far and wide and aid in the fast expansion of the local tourism industry. Greg Lafrady, CGTN. Northern Ireland is marking the centenary of its creation as a territory within the UK amid growing doubts about its future status. Early in the 20th century, pressure for Irish independence from the United Kingdom was becoming irresistible and broke into violent conflict in 1919. But Protestants in Ulster were opposed to self-government on the mainly Catholic island. So in 1921, the UK government partitioned Ireland so that Northern Ireland could remain part of the UK. During the troubles in the 1970s and 80s, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland became a heavily fortified zone. Tension eased in the 1990s with the creation of the European Single Market and the Good Friday Agreement, making the border largely invisible. But the UK's Brexit deal this year left Northern Ireland linked to the EU single market still. That's being seen as, uh, by many as increasing the prospect of a united Ireland and an end to partition. Well, for more on this, let's speak to Amanda Ferguson, a journalist who writes on Northern Irish matters for the Irish Times and the Washington Post, among others. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. So much has happened in the past century and just in recent weeks, a reminder of just how potentially dangerous and delicate the situation in Northern Ireland remains. Yes, that's right. You know, we have a fragile peace process, and I think that sometimes uh, people view the 1998 Good Friday Agreement that brought a relative peace to Northern Ireland as an event, but it's actually a process, and that reconciliation work is ongoing. And of all the recent issues that we have been facing with Brexit, with the uh, border in the Irish Sea, with violence on the streets, and now the crisis, the internal crisis in the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, what is the most concerning at the moment? Well, I think that, you know, we, we are moving into a phase where Northern Ireland is a very much a different place uh, from it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago or even 20 or 10 years ago. And today marks... Um, either some people view it as the partition of Ireland or others view it as the foundation of, of, of Northern Ireland. Some people want to uh, celebrate that while others are deeply upset about it. And then uh, there's a third rump of people who feel apathy towards it. So I think that, you know, the, the stability of government is very important. I think uh, a respect for the various identities within Northern Ireland is very important. You know, some of us are British. Some of us are Irish, some of us feel distinctly Northern Irish, uh, some of us are a combination of those things, um, and other people have made uh, you know, the, the place that I call home their home as well. So I think that it's important to reflect that um, Northern Ireland isn't the place that it was 100 years ago, um, and certainly uh, conversations need to be ongoing around the, the reconciliation piece that I, that I talked about earlier, but certainly while there's always been conversations about the future of Northern Ireland and a possible uh, referendum, a possible border poll on Irish unity, I think that uh, making sure that the relationships uh, on the ground uh, are, are very important. I think that what Brexit has done is accelerate the conversations about Irish unity because um, you know, it, it disturbed that kind of border question uh, that had, had largely been taken away uh, by the Good Friday Agreement peace process. And certainly the, the change in demographics and the political landscape in Northern Ireland is changing. So uh, particularly those who would view themselves as British unionists um, are having to face up, of, up to the reality that it's a different place uh, than it was previously. And that you know, ultimately, no matter what the trading arrangements are, uh, or who's at the top of, of government, uh, that it will be for the people to decide their future in a democratic vote. So you think reunification is a realistic possibility. What could that look like? I think, I think it is a realistic possibility. I don't see it happening in the short term, but I can see it happening in the medium uh, to long term. Um, I think that uh, all of those uh, sort of interesting questions are being teased out at the moment. Uh, people are starting you know, to ask you know, for people to put sort of flesh on the bones of what uh, a united Ireland would look like. Uh, some people are referred 
uh, referred to it as, as a new Ireland um, or as a shared island. There's a lot of different sort of language uh, around what what it might look like. I think that for those uh, in Northern Ireland who are Irish Republicans, uh, they're having conversations around, you know, in a new Ireland, uh, you know, how, how would British identity be respected? Because there's a considerable uh, population within Northern Ireland that is that is of a, of a British background and doesn't feel remotely Irish. Um, you know, there are some people who feel like they have a dual identity, that they feel British and Irish as well. Then there's others, as I said, that just feel solely Irish. So I think that uh, there's a lot of conversations happening around uh, how what would the health service look like? Uh, you know, wh what would education be like? What would it mean uh, for um, symbols and emblems and all the things that uh, are important to some people that live here? So uh, th those conversations are happening on a daily basis you know, around kitchen tables, you know, in pubs, uh, you know, between political parties, uh, on on the airwaves. Uh, it's happening all the time, um, and I think that it's it's useful to have those conversations because. You know, while uh, a lot of people are still resistant uh, to the idea of Irish unity, uh, those people who are feeling that way are, are starting to understand that they need to sell the benefits of Northern Ireland remaining in the United Kingdom uh, to those in the middle uh, who could perhaps be persuaded either way. So it, it's a very interesting time, but certainly it's a, it's um, it provokes a lot of fear among some people, um, and you know that's something that that isn't going to go away anytime soon. So I think that. Uh, as long as the uh, adults are, are mature about this and have sensible conversations and have uh, conversations in the appropriate platforms at their own pace, uh, then that's something that's very useful uh, to, to, to do because the conversation isn't going anywhere. And as I said, it was Brexit that accelerated that, but the conversations have been happening throughout the last hundred years. So, Indeed. Well, Amanda Ferguson joining us from Belfast. Thank you very much indeed. Still ahead on CGTN. A music festival returns to Liverpool for a one-off COVID experiment. More than 100,000 people in Italy have now died from COVID-19. The vaccination programme offers some hope for the future, but intensive care units are near capacity. The Spanish government is hoping to vaccinate over one million people by next month. Living in Germany are struggling with their mental health. Hungary is supplementing the EU's vaccine rollout, buying doses from Russia and China to speed up the process. Four million people have tested positive in France. After a grim winter, the promise of a spring bloom that could mean freedom for millions. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we're trying to save the world. Oh, I can We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. The agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Paul Barber and me, Juliet Mann. Our top stories. Face to face for the first time in two years, G7 foreign ministers meet in London. 
The EU looks to open up to foreign tourists this summer after a year of pandemic isolation. And Apple goes to court as a leading games firm sues it over claims of market abuse. Returning to our top story, foreign ministers of the G7 are here in London for their first face-to-face -face meeting since the pandemic began. The seven members make up nearly half of the global economy. They're set to discuss a range of topics, including the pandemic recovery and relations with China and Russia. Our correspondent, Nawid Jabarkil, is outside number 10 Downing Street in London, and he joins us now. So, Nawid, what are the most pressing issues on the agenda? Yeah, well, we've just had to step outside of Downing Street because the area has been in lockdown since Anthony Blinken uh, came. He's currently uh, with Dominic Raab, the UK Foreign Secretary, and his US counterparts giving a press conference in the building you can see just above my right shoulder. When the Americans travel, security tends to be tight. Now, the, the two men have spoken already. China was one area that they said that uh, both sides were looking to work closer with on climate change. And the reason for that is US President Joe Biden has made it one of his key foreign policy pledges to expect uh, plenty of uh, words about the environment and climate change to feature heavily in these meetings over the next few days. Aside from that, COVID-19, the pandemic, this is the first time in two years, more than two years, that uh, these seven countries are meeting their foreign ministers in person, and that was because of the pandemic. The last time they did meet was in April 2019, back in France, that was then. Uh, the countries taking part, UK, US, uh, both, uh, as I've just mentioned, as well as Canada, Japan, the only Asian nation, and then three European nations, France, Germany, and Italy. The EU is also involved in these talks in the coming days. And aside from that, further afield, uh, four other countries have also been invited. India, South Korea, Australia, three key countries in the Indo-Pacific, as well as South Africa. Uh, the UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson inviting those countries because uh, Britain's trying to increase its influence in that part of the world. But the, uh, as we speak, uh, um, Comments still coming in from uh, Foreign Minister Raab. Uh, he said that both sides were looking to try and defend the rule of law, as he called it. He went on to say that they had concerns about Russia and Ukraine. Now, Antony Blinken, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State, moves on from here later this week to Ukraine after that military buildup on the border on both sides with Ukraine and Russia. So that's an area of concern that we should uh, expect to hear plenty of in the, in the next few days. But looking forward further, this is also about what comes next month in June in southwest England, in Cornwall, will be the actual uh, G7. That's when the world leaders, the likes of Boris Johnson, who's not here today, he's coincidentally up in the north of England where uh, local elections are taking place across the UK. But Joe Biden, his first foreign trip as US president to Europe, he'll be here next month. And uh, a few moments ago, Anthony Blinken saying that he was very much looking forward to that trip. So this is a precursor, if you like, a testbed for that main G7 when world leaders would meet along with those four countries that I mentioned coming in as guests as well. Paul. Well, as you just said, Nawid, Anthony Blinken and Dominic Raab have just spoken. Let's just have a listen to a little bit of what Dominic Raab had to say about the challenges facing the world. Our societies, our economies have been shocked and shaken by coronavirus. At the same time, we're responding to a situation where our values are being challenged. The international architecture is, at least in some respects, being weakened. And there's also the rapid technological change, which brings new opportunities. We've seen that with the collaboration on things like the vaccine, but also acute challenges. Uh, and there are global threats from COVID to climate change that, that frankly demand global solutions. And we're committed to trying to find and forge those solutions. Dominic, Rob there. So, Nawid, some countries are also meeting on the sidelines. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, Bling, uh, Anthony Blinken, as soon as he touched down here, it's been really, really, really busy for these foreign uh, ministers. He's met with his Japanese and South Korean counterparts. Dominic Raab himself met with uh, the Japanese foreign minister earlier today, uh, Motegi. And really what they're focusing on is trade on the one hand, because the G7 countries represent around half of the world's economy. So if they, if the world is to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, these countries represented here over the next few days will be absolutely crucial to that. Uh, further afield, uh, they, they're also looking at security as well. That's why those countries from the Indo-Pacific have been invited to this. Essentially, what the West is trying to do here, what the UK and US in particular are trying to do, is put on uh, this uh, assertive front of trying to unite these countries against what they see as perceived threat. 
threats. Uh, now, with that regard, the ASEAN Association of Southeast Asian Nations is also, has also been invited to this. Its chair will be uh, taking part in the formal meetings, which start tomorrow and continue on Wednesday. That's a, a trading bloc which represents economies, 10 economies in Southeast Asia, and they represent 3.1 trillion U.S. dollars of trade. So uh, expect plenty more uh, words about free trade agreements and deal, uh, trade deals to be on the agenda over the coming days. But essentially, I think what this uh, fundamentally is about is about trying to get the G7 back on track. You'll remember President Trump wasn't a big fan of these multilateral organizations. He saw them as ineffective, as rather much a waste of time. That's not the message from President Joe Biden. And I think that's why uh, the UK and the US trying to put on this united front to say multilateralism is back and the Western alliance is going to try and take a more forceful place in the world. Paul. Louis Jabarkel in Westminster, many thanks. Meanwhile, the UK has been laying out plans for new freedoms as COVID restrictions are eased. From May the 17th, funerals in England will no longer be capped at 30 mourners. Scotland is also loosening its rules, as is Wales from today, with up to two households able to meet and hug indoors, and gyms and other leisure facilities reopening. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said he believes Britain will be able to ditch the one-metre social distancing rule by mid-June. He hinted that there could be some opening up of foreign travel from mid-May, despite concerns about COVID variants. Around 5,000 people were able to ditch that rule for a few hours on Sunday as part of an experiment. This one-off music festival in Liverpool was part of a trial to see if such events spread coronavirus. This one lasted six hours and had a strict 10 p.m. curfew, but it was still welcomed by many who were able to party like it was 2019. It's good to get it all started again and yeah. just like to test whether it can all work for summer yeah. and if like if it will go ahead in summer as yeah. well. So. They need to get actual data ready to see whether it's going to work, so we're happy to be a part of it. Yeah, there's no reason why anyone no, no, should no, yeah. catch anything, yeah, 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 so yeah. I'm I'm at ease with everything. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited. Reckless and dangerous is how police have described violent scenes at Old Trafford on Sunday. Fans of Manchester United stormed the stadium in protest at the American owners, the Glazer family, whose supporters claim have driven the club into debt and decline. Nicole Johnston reports. On Sunday, angry, frustrated football fans let their team's owners know it. These Manchester United fans say they've had enough of their US club owners and their failed attempt to join a European Super League last month. We're just going to have to keep going and uh, see what happens. Uh, I think one protest is not going to get the Glazers out, is it? It's going to take a long time. They only think about money, don't they? You know, it's, that's all they're interested in, money. You know, that's, the, that's their only motivation. They don't care about English football. They don't know the culture. Uh, they, might, they might have taken a little bit of notice after their failed attempt to get the Super League going, but I doubt it, really. You know, it's only, only, only money will get rid of him. The protest of about 1,000 people started outside the Old Trafford Stadium before the match against Liverpool. Over 100 fans forced their way into the grounds where the match was due to be played behind closed doors because of COVID-19 restrictions. The game was postponed. The team's supporters' trust says, we are disgusted, embarrassed and angry at the owners' actions in relation to the planning, formation and announcement of the European Super League. The club's owners have apologised for the Super League move, but it's not enough. I think the relationship between the Glazer family and United supporters is at rock bottom. I don't see how it will get much better from here. Before the US-based Glazer family took over Manchester United 16 years ago, it was a debt-free club. Now it has $630 million of debt. United supporters are unhappy because the Glazers, basically, they borrowed money to purchase the club. They didn't have their own funds. They borrowed the money and then they saddled that debt on to the club. So fans have lost faith in Manchester United's owners, and some say the relationship is beyond repair. Nicole Johnston, CGTN, London. Opposition supporters are celebrating in West Bengal after beating the Hindu Nationalist Party of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. 
The Prime Minister has been heavily criticised for focusing on local elections in five states, despite a lethal second wave of the pandemic. The country has recorded more than 300,000 new infections for 12 days in a row. Shweta Bajaj reports from Delhi. The devastating second wave of uh, COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc in India. If I could give you the fresh case, 350,000 new fresh cases in India on Monday. This is the seventh day running in India, which, has, which have seen more than 350,000 cases uh, being added every day. Uh, only on the 21st of April, the country's figures had breached 300,000 in, in daily caseload, and that continues to surge ahead. Uh, Currently, the Narendra Modi-led government has said that it is ramping up and chalking out a plan for oxygen supply. There has been a huge demand of oxygen as this particular wave of COVID-19 uh, seems to be attacking directly lungs of people and the situation remains grim. Many hospitals here in Delhi really scrambling for oxygen. Uh, in the terms of fatalities, the official data is, is close to about 3,500 people who have lost their lives in the last 24 hours, but the crematoriums, graveyards, and what we are seeing on the ground is telling a completely different uh, story. Shweta Bajaj in Delhi. There's more freedom for French people today as the country eases out of its third COVID lockdown. Schools are welcoming back pupils aged over 11, albeit with some curbs on the number that can attend each day. The rule confining people to a 10-kilometre radius of their homes is ending as a domestic travel ban is lifted. The nighttime curfew, though, uh, remains in place. Well, Ross Cullen joins us now from Paris. Hello there, Ross. A, a big day in France. Tell us about that and what's coming next. Yeah, that's right. Uh, as you laid out, uh, secondary schools are back in action uh, today for stage two of the government's five-step strategy to ease the current restrictions. Primary schools went back uh, last week. Secondary schools are back today, also being removed today. That domestic uh, travel limit you mentioned it used to be 10 kilometres, six miles, the maximum distance you could go from your house. That's now being scrapped, so you can travel as much as you like, wherever you like, in France, as long as you are back inside by 7 p.m. That nighttime curfew remains in place, 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. We've had a curfew of some sort, Juliet, in place in France since the middle of December last year, so people are eager to see that relaxed, and they could well see it relaxed in stage three. The 19th of May, the government wants to push the curfew back to start at 9 p.m. It also wants to be able to open the terrasse, those terraces. You might be familiar with the famous outdoor uh, sections of cafes, bars and restaurants spilling out onto the pavement and at times spilling out onto the road, requisitioning parts of the highway for temporary decking. That's something we saw last year in between the first and second lockdown when cafes were able to open for the first time. And that temporary decking in many, in many places has been made permanent. So places that do not have an outdoor area are able to welcome customers back on the 19th of May outside. After that, the next one, date for your diary, something else uh, that we were discussing a little bit earlier, travel, non uh, tourists to be able to come into uh, France uh, from the 9th of June as long as they have a COVID-19 vaccine certificate, a digital passport, something that's being worked out, the finer details at EU level. But it's so important for not just France, but for other countries like Italy, Croatia, Greece, which really rely on the boost they get from the summer tourism season to support their economies. So if the EU can sort out and the agreement on a digital passport, on a COVID-19 vaccine certificate, on a health pass, uh, then they'll be able to allow foreign visitors into France from the 9th of June. And on the 30th of June, France hopes it will be able to lift all restrictions on cafes and bars and remove that curfew entirely. So steps towards back to normal, but a lot of this hinges on the vaccination rollout. How's that going? Yeah, that has to run in tandem with the easing of restrictions. Looking back to January and February, it really was a glacial rollout plagued by logistical problems. But right now, the pace uh, has picked up more than 400,000 jabs being given a day, 16 million people with their first jab, six and a half million people having received their second jab. And the government does, though, need to accelerate even more to hit its next two targets, first vaccinating um, 10 million people, then 20 million people by the middle of May, 30 million people by the middle of June. And from the 15th of June, it does hope that it will be able to offer the vaccine to all adults over the age of 18. Well, Ross Cullen, thank you very much. Ross Cullen in Paris with just over an hour before curfew.
Restaurants and cafes across Greece opened their doors for outdoor dining on Monday. They've been shut since November as part of the wider COVID restrictions. Customers flocked to soak up the sunshine and a return to what they hope is a more normal life. The third wave of the pandemic has hit Greece hard, with the majority of the country's deaths taking place over the past few months. Businesses in Hungary are welcoming back customers as coronavirus infections slowly recede across the country. Yes, people who are vaccinated can now go indoors to take part in a variety of pastimes. Penelope Lersch reports. Relaxing in the water at Budapest's thermal baths, a Hungarian tradition that's been deeply missed for almost six months. I have paralysis for 70 years. Without my daily bath, it's almost unbearable. With the baths reopened, regulars couldn't wait to return to the water, vaccination cards in hand. I called other regulars on the phone to come here. There were six of us here in the morning. Yesterday, when I was here, 20 people came. But from a business point of view, it's been tough. Multiple closures mean it will take a while to bounce back. The closure has taken a huge toll on the spa. We had many foreign visitors until 15th of March 2020. An average of 5,000 guests came every day. And this weekend, only 500 came. This climbing gym opened in the winter, hoping to bring climbers indoors away from freezing conditions. Only now is the gym filling up with rope access courses and adult climbers keen to get back off the ground. I am super excited to have this place open finally because uh, it was a nightmare sitting all through lockdown without, without doing anything, having to do anything. So it is, it is so good to finally be able to move again. It's been a steep climb for Hungary from recording the world's highest number of daily COVID deaths to reopening the economy just weeks later. The government says the large-scale vaccination program has driven infection numbers down, but people are anxious to see if they'll rise again. We, we cross our fingers uh, thanks to the high number of, of vaccine, vaccinated people. The potential force wave will be not so... Not so for us, we will see. The country is now working toward the next milestone, 5 million vaccinations. From there, more restrictions are expected to lift with weddings and family reunions to take place again. Penelope Leish, CGTN, Budapest. You're watching CGTN still to come. Bullfighting fans in Spain celebrate as Madrid's famous La Ventas Bullring hosts its first event since the outbreak of COVID. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world. All around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome back. After an absence of 19 months, bullfighting made its return to Madrid in front of thousands of fans. The charity event was designed to raise money for matadors who've been out of work since the outbreak of the pandemic. Rahul Pathak reports from Madrid. Bullfighting back at Las Ventas, its spiritual home. Six matadors performing in front of 6,000 fans. COVID restrictions meaning the event could only take place with Las Ventas at 25% capacity. Sunday's spectacle was designed to raise money for the estimated 200,000 people who work in the bullfighting industry, an industry that normally has a turnover of $4.8 billion. However, that's been decimated by the financial fallout of the pandemic. One of the matadors taking part on Sunday was Paco Ureña. A year ago, CDTN Europe met Paco whilst bullfighting was on its enforced hiatus. At the time, he did not know when he would be returning to Las Ventas, so Sunday was an emotional moment for him. It was a beautiful afternoon. Us bullfighters were finally able to reconnect with our fans, and that's the most important thing we achieved. Now, this event is not only a sporting one, but a political one. It's been held with the blessing of Madrid's right-wing president, Isabel Ayuso, who's currently running for re-election. Now, it's designed to show her support for the bullfighting industry, which contains many of her strongest supporters. And it's also there to show the national government in Spain that Madrid needs to be able to hold big events like this with fans attending, spending their money, so to get the local economy moving again. It's a big relief to be back here. We've been locked up at home and we could have been watching bullfights before now. I was so keen to come back. I've been so excited that I've been studying the different bulls from the different ranches that are participating here today. Despite all the euphoria, bullfighting remains controversial amongst the wider population. In recent years, it's become more of a political issue, with animal rights groups siding with the left-wing parties, whilst those on the right say it should be protected as a Spanish art form. Today was a really important step forward. We hope everything now starts to get going and that they allow us to continue with our bullfights and to perform whenever we get the opportunity. We want to continue to enjoy bullfighting. Judging from the crowds, bullfighting remains hugely popular with its fan base. But for Paco and his fellow matadors, their long-term future is still far from certain. Rahul Pafak, CDTN, Madrid. Well, from Madrid to ancient Rome. And try to imagine what it must have been like to fight to the death as a gladiator in the Colosseum. Well, from 2023, visitors to the ancient amphitheatre in the Italian capital can get that one step closer. Plans have been unveiled for a new high-tech floor, which will cost just over $20 million to build. The rotating structure will be made of wooden slats, which can be opened up to reveal the labyrinth of rooms below. Luckily, though, the reconstruction stops there. No lions or tigers are included in the new plans. What about bears? I don't know. <laughs> Well, the headlines are, again, a quick reminder of our top stories. Face to face for the first time in two years, G7 foreign ministers meet in London. The EU looks to open up to foreign tourists this summer after a year of pandemic isolation. And Apple goes to court as a leading games firm sues it over claims of market abuse. And that is it for Global Business Europe. Thank you for watching. More on all our stories at europe.cgcn.com and follow CGCN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're available to watch on smart TV apps such as Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. You can also find us on YouTube and Daily Motion as well as CGTN.com and the CGTN app. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team here in London, goodbye. Bye-bye.